public consultation which ended on 29th of uh, January. Okay, as uh, our chair uh, person uh, uh, told you at the beginning, um, and Bremer was in fact uh, my predecessor at AWARE, she was a research and advocacy director, and she started um, AWARE submission uh, for the budget in 2011. So we have uh, four parts that we're going to talk with, AWARE's past and present initiatives, where does Singapore stand on budget transparency, AWARE's recommendations, and what can civil society do? Okay, the first part. Um, we are continuing the advocacy that Bremer started. So we continue to focus on the issues that impact on women. Um, some of these have already been discussed by the previous speaker, so we won't take a lot of time on that. Um, first is income inequality and poverty, and we have already had ample discussions on that. Um, caregiving, healthcare, and the budget process, which is a new focus for us. Okay, so how did we develop this new focus? Okay, it started with our being invited to uh, some regional meetings in February and October last year in Jakarta, um, which was to bring together some civil society representatives and government officials. So we received this invitation out of the blue from a group that was organizing uh, these meetings. We'll talk to you about which group it is. Uh, there was no Singapore official present, even though uh, the uh, Singapore government were, had been invited. So there was only AWARE in February, and then in October it was AWARE and RIMA. And other Southeast Asian governments were represented. Okay, so what were the meetings about? They were about the Open Budget Index. This is the only independent, comparative and regular measure of budget transparency and accountability around the world. So the Open Budget Index is a ranking of countries on budget transparency. That is whether the government provides the public with timely access to comprehensive information contained in eight key budget documents. And uh, we will say a bit about what these eight key documents are. So 125 countries agreed to be included in the Open Budget Survey, and Singapore is not one of them. So this uh, Open Budget Index is the result of an Open Budget in, uh, Survey that is done every two years, and it's done by this group, the International Budget Partnership. So this was the group that organized those meetings in Jakarta to which we were invited. So they have a, a website which you are encouraged to visit. This um, op, uh, international budget uh, partnership spans more than 100 countries. And, and we're very glad that so many of you, so many organizations are interested in the budget and definitely we will tell the organizers that these are the other country, uh, organizations that can be approached for subsequent meetings. Okay, so where does Singapore stand on budget transparency? So, although Singapore is not one of the 125 countries that were ranked, let's look at how they would be ranked if we were to look at the public availability and comprehensiveness of eight key budget documents. So first of all, it, the government does not release all of the eight budget documents and I, we will show you a table of that. There's no Freedom of Information Act as we well know. And, and this public consultation is only for the pre-budget period and other consultations, for example, by IPS, is only by invitation. Okay, so here's a table of these eight key budget documents. So we have a number, there will be two slides, we have numbered the documents. So first would be the pre-budget statement. Okay, so this is supposed to be released to the public six months before the fiscal year. So we have no pre-budget statement, okay? So that means they have a consultation, but they don't tell you about certain key things like what are the macroeconomic assumptions, what are the government sources of revenue, what is our debt and debt status. So they don't tell you any of those things and you just kind of like out of the, out of a vacuum, supposed to just present them with some comments, okay? Secondly, there is the executive budget proposal. This is supposed to be released three months before the financial year. Now we have the Minister of Finance 
budget speech with some illustrations, and then there are these um, revenue and expenditure estimates, okay? Um, then there is the citizen budget, which will be released at the same time as number two, but apart from some um, cartoons and some illustrations, we also don't have a comprehensive citizen budget. Then there is the enacted budget, and that is when, after the second speech, after the parliamentary debate takes place for, say, three weeks, then there is the roundup speech, and then the President of Singapore signs the Supply Act into, uh, into, into enactment. But there, is, there are no details given in the Supply Act, and only the total sum that the government is allowed to spend in the fiscal year is mentioned. Okay, and we have no India reports. Now we hear, and maybe people here who are civil servants might know, that there are actually these India reports that are every month or every quarter, but they are not released to the public. And then there's supposed to be a mid-year review, which is released in the middle of the financial year, but we also don't have that. Then there is an, an audit, um, which should be of the year-end report. So we have no year-end report from MOF itself, and the spending of individual ministries is also not open to the public. So there was an exchange um, in Parliament in 2010 when Lo Tiang Kiang asked, you know, he said that previously he could find out about the spending of individual ministries, but now this uh, information is no longer disclosed, and this is when um, he was told that if he, if he wanted to look it up, he should look it up in the expenditure control document, which is only in the parliamentary library for MPs and not to the public. Okay, so individual ministries such as MOE and just now uh, Leong, Mr. Leong mentioned the Educational Digest, they may voluntarily release information. But MOH, for example, had annual, re uh, annual reports before, but no longer. Okay, so we never know actually, you know, about the individual spending of the various ministries. Then there's an audit report. In other countries, usually this requires six months, but we are super efficient and we can do it in three months. And in fact, when um, this was one of the questions that was asked of the AWARE group that went to Singapore, how long it takes for the audit, and uh, the trainers were very astounded to hear that the audit could be done in three months. Okay, so we have all these gaps. Okay, so of the, of the eight budget documents that should be released, we actually have only three of them and actually five of them are missing. There's no pre-budget statement, there's no citizen's budget, and actually we don't even have a real full budget report. Because if you, if you go to uh, the website of the governments of the UK, Canada, New Zealand, any, any country, even Philippines or South Africa, you can see that when the Chancellor or the Minister for Finance releases a budget, there is an actual budget. What we have are two speeches. We have the speeches coming up on the 21st of February, then after the parliamentary debate, there will be a roundup speech. We have two speeches. And then we have this revenue and expenditure estimates, which I encourage you to go and look at. It, it is 300 uh, pages long, but you look at the breakdown, and the kind of breakdown is how much they spend on facilities, how much they spend on salaries, and nothing about programs. Um, I'm going to give you an example of that. So no uh, details on Supply Act and no year-in uh, year reports and all that, which I've said. Okay, this is the annual budget cycle, which we got from the website of the Civil Service College. But uh, we wrote about this in our article on 24th of January, budget process needs to be more open and inclusive. It was published by the Straits Times. Uh, we were quite glad that the Straits Times accepted the article. And uh, after our article was published, this is no longer available on the Civil Service College website. <laughs> <laughs> However, luckily we have downloaded the document. So you can see that actually the budget is a year-long process. And it actually starts in August and the ministry submit their proposals and so on and so forth. And, and then, like this year, for this uh, budget, the public consultation begins in uh, November, and then, and then the, the cabinet actually uh, uh, approves the submitted consolidated budget for the Minister of Finance to <coughs> announce. 
and then we end our public consultation, and then by then he has already, look, 29 January, 21st February, he's going to be announcing the budget. So is it enough time for us to be heard? Okay, so this, uh, this public consultation comes too late, and the time given is too short, and we don't have, even have enough information about what we're supposed to comment on, right? So in fact, after the Minister for Finance announces the budget, we should still be giving our comments. So I think uh, my uh, suggestion is that we should just ignore this close and open public consultation, which will give our opinions and consult throughout the year because the budget cycle is throughout the year. So, you know, as uh, Brim was saying, take back our citizenship rights. We should be commenting. <laughs> have instead of all eight documents what information is available so for example last year the minister for finance said that we want to see singaporeans out of pocket share of medical costs for and the government take on a larger share blah 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 and so um you know very uh, noble sentiments are being expressed but no details on how this intent will be achieved so when you actually go and look at the figures you don't know which of those budget lines will go to reducing the out-of-pocket expenses. So the rhetoric will be in one, or at one level, but when you actually look at the figures, they will tell you how much was spent on computers, how much was spent on buildings, how much was... But not on actually how are they going to reduce the out-of-pocket shares. Okay. So we have this parliamentary debate coming up. So our, on 21st February, the Minister for Finance will give this speech, will, which will be quite long, a few hours, and then um, then Parliament will sit. We hear, we understand from the parliamentarians they are given five days to think about the budget, and then there will be this parliamentary debate, which will be about um, two or three weeks, and. Um, the expectation is that the budget will be enacted on the 14th of March. So we want to know what is the significance of the parliamentary debate. So we looked up last year. In the period of this parliamentary debate and when the budget, uh, budget was eventually adopted, there were two changes adopted. One is exemption of loan restrictions for a car for the disabled. The second is extension of temporary transfer scheme for nine months to one year to help use car dealers cope with the financial restrictions on the, on the industry. So that was all. However, the Minister for Finance mentioned some good ideas that came up from the parliamentary debate. So there are six ideas he mentioned. So these are the six ideas that he said will be considered. But let's see this year whether we know about the results of the consideration. Okay, because even among the parliamentarians, there were some proposals. There were proposals, proposals for example, number six, taxing properties based on total value of properties owned by an individual as opposed to the current per property basis. In other words, this is trying to tax people who have second and third properties at a higher rate than, you know, just based on individual properties. That, that would, I would read as an intent of that. So these are supposedly good ideas. So let's see this year whether this, uh, you know, were um, adopted to any extent. Okay, I'd like now to move on to AWARE's recommendations for the budget. So this year, what we are trying to do is to question the fundamental approaches to the budget rather than just looking at the issues. As uh, Brema said, you know, you know, it's all very well to look at the issues, but you know, what are the un what's the underlying matrix there? So we question some of these issues, like is social spending too low? And uh, Mr. Leong has also alluded to that. And another thing we find is that for all that we are concerned about social mobility and no Singaporean being left out in an inclusive society, we find that children are advantaged or disadvantaged based on their parents' behaviour. Are they employed? Are they married to the right people? You know, and so on. Who did they choose as a spouse? Did their spouse have a citizenship PR or foreign citizenship? You know? And policies are requiring a lot of self-reliance from individuals in contexts where problems cannot be addressed at the individual level. And healthcare is a prime example of that. 
I think we have this marvelous means testing of people where it's not just the individuals in need who are tested, but all their family members, regardless of whether the family members are supporting that poor individual or not. And, and people are being rejected on the basis that they have some rich cousin somewhere. <laughs> In fact, we found a good example from within government practice. The Ministry of Law, Legal Aid Bureau actually has a much better means testing method where they look only at the disposable income and disposable assets of the individual in need and they don't means test the family members. But the Ministry of Health from 2012 onwards decided to do this means testing of family members with no justification given why they decided to do that. The only thing is that of course this leads to cutting out more people. Okay, um, so now to the issues. On income and, uh, and poverty, income inequality and poverty, we have four recommendations. The first is on the Gini coefficient and both Roy and uh, Mr. Jung have uh, spoken on this. And we think that the government should take concrete measures to bring the Gini coefficient down to below 0.4, which the UN has, has identified as that's the threshold for when you're going to have uh, social instability. Okay, and these are figures from the Department of Statistics, and here are the Gini coefficient figures. The blue line means the household income from work per household member. And the red line is after there are government transfers, okay? So in other words, the red line is lower than the blue line because government transfers and taxes are supposed to mitigate the effects of, you know, the high Gini coefficient. Okay, so you can see that after mitigation, the raw Gini coefficient of 0 0.478 fell to 0 0.459. However, when you actually look at it, you can see this reduction by government transfers and taxes is in fact falling. Okay, in 2011, the mitigation was 0 0.025 and by 2012, the mitigation was only by 0 0.019. And this, is, this mitigation is so negligible in OECD, in the OECD countries, the transfers reduce inequality by one quarter and we are reducing by 0 0.019. This is like hardly anything. It's not even 0 0.1, you know, it's 0 0.019. Okay, the second um, recommendation is on poverty. Now, you know that um, the government has come up against having a poverty line because the poverty line will be so inefficient. They won't enable us to help the poor who should be helped but must not know that they are the poor for some reason. <laughs> okay, we, we did some research on that. It is true that the poverty line is just a line is being debated and people are talking about you should have you know more sophisticated measures from different uh, perspectives but it doesn't mean no perspective or no measurement right so therefore there should be a way to track the extent to which poverty is reduced okay if you say you don't want the poverty line we don't care but give us a means of tracking whether your your policy and programs are working we don't know that there is in fact very little tracking, very little monitoring, very little accountability. So what we have are ways of policies and programs that get on one another. On top, you never hear anything that we're going to get rid of, we cancel that policy, you never hear that. It's just laid on one, one on top of the other. And then there's no monitoring accountability. We don't know whether something works, something doesn't work. It's all blank. Okay. Social protection spending, and we were very glad to find this as a concrete source, okay, because this allows us to name it. Because the Asian Development Bank, and this is not like the world's most radical body, right, Asian Development Bank, they have a social protection index. You can find it on the website. Singapore has this 0 0.169, and the social protection spending is only 3.5% of GDP. If you compare with Korea, which has a per capita GDP less than half that of Singapore, Korea has an SPI social protection index of 0 0.2 with 7.9% of GDP allocated to social protection. 
Okay, Japan is much higher, and Japan has a GDP higher than Singapore. You see, so Singapore is a high income country in the Asia and Pacific region, is really spending too little, far less than what it should for a high income country, and it's putting vulnerable groups with it. So we have it in, in figures. Okay, I've already talked about means testing and basically we shouldn't have this situation where individuals are being called upon to deplete all their resources before they can be eligible for public assistance. There's a large number of people who are dying with less than $2,000 in their bank accounts. And maybe they depleted this in order to get onto public assistance. Okay, another area that we're looking at is caregiving. Now we find that for all the talk about, you know, promoting our total fertility rate, how pro-family we are, we're actually not very pro-family and we're definitely not pro-children. Okay, so first caregivers, caregivers are considered as you do it out of your own um, willingness, your goodness of heart, and too bad if you become financially insecure because then your husbands and children should then come and look after you and it's nobody else's business. So there is lack of, care, lack of support for caregivers and the policies that support children are also not prioritizing their physical and psychological well-being. So we are recommending that every child should be supported to have a family home including subsidized public housing and not just dependent on whether oh the parents happen to be married or the parents are divorced or the parents didn't get married at all that is not the fault of the child okay but the children are being penalized and especially for those with uh, mothers who are foreign uh, foreign wives they can be easily deported uh, access to all uh, levels of education are also very important to children, access to material resources and so on. So we want to recommend um, you know, prioritizing the rights of children as children. Okay, we also want to recommend caregiving as a public good. That is not just people uh, uh, doing, uh, you know, providing care out of the goodness of their hearts, but something that everybody should have adequate uh, access to, not just those who can afford to pay for a foreign domestic worker or those who can afford to send their children to expensive childcare centres and so on. Um, and actually, when we looked at OECD research, we found that even for those countries that are very concerned about raising total fertility rate across all OECD countries, the thing that has been the most effective is providing childcare as a public good. And there should be work-life balance for all employees, not just as a discretionary decision for individual employers. Okay, another area that uh, we have given recommendations on is healthcare. And healthcare, I can see, is also uh, has been elaborated upon in Namara submission, so I'm not going to deal too much with that. Um, basically, we think that the 3M system is beyond rescue. <laughs> so it's no point like trying to tweak this, tweak that, you know, and extend the uh, medicine or whatever. The whole thing is uh, is actually so totally flawed. As uh, Mr. Leung has said, the government is not actually spending a cent because Medisafe is by us, right? It's totally from us here. Medisafe, we've got to pay the premiums for it and they're even profiting from the premiums. Then Medifund is actually a transfer into an endowment fund and we're just lucky that they have got profits from their investments. And that's how we are getting the money for Medifund. So, so we are getting no allocations whatsoever from the public purse, from this famous 3M system. The 3M system is not a public system, it's actually the citizens' own system. And however, despite the fact that it's our own system, the thing is that the government can make decisions about our money, can make decisions about whether you can use Medisafe for screening, whether MediShield covers this or doesn't cover this. They're making the rules for the money that we are providing. And finally, uh, 
or we would make some recommendations on transparency, all those missing uh, information that is not available to us. We also want data disaggregated by the key factors of gender, age, ethnicity, income, disability, marital status. We want the expenditure control document to be public. We think ministers must answer questions when asked in parliament because this has already happened and we think that Singapore should enact the Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> Last part, last part. Okay, the last part is what can civil society do? So we found the training that we had with the International Budget Partnership quite useful because they gave us a whole range of things that civil society can do. So we picked up a few of these things, monitoring for advocacy, some methods. So we can do a social economic analysis, which is what we're kind of doing here, which is assessing how a budget affects or would affect people in different categories based on class, gender, ethnicity, and so on. Uh, how we will analyze revenue, how we will analyze allocations and expenditures. So basically we are doing this exercise now. We can do social edit, uh, social audit. That means to assess whether the work of a government department has been used for the purpose intended. Like for instance, if they say that they want to reduce out-of-pocket share of health costs, then we have to see whether buying computers, building hospitals, you know, all these kind of things, really does that reduce out-of-pocket costs? This is the appropriateness thing. Costing, are they paying more than they should for certain services, okay? And then, this is another uh, thing to think about. Uh, in other countries, they've done public budget and poverty hearings. That is, civil society can convene meetings of people who are bearing the impact, like, people, like single parent households, like people who have been made homeless when they you know, had to sell their HDB flat due to divorce, or whatever it is, you know, those people who get impacted on, you can have a, a hearing on that. There's a citizen's report club, uh, card which is assessing user satisfaction with public services. This is based on surveys and focus group discussions. And then this can be combined with the community score card where we can actually bring in the service providers, the ministries and say, well, this is what these people are saying and what do you say to that? Like for instance, uh, they, uh, maybe because now uh, ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We get uh, strange little things like they'll send a packet to a blind person saying that these are the new coins, you know, and they have little, um, uh, rather than uh, the, the uh, visually handicapped person may not actually need this, but they push it. So is this, is this really helpful to the person who is, you know, blind? So this is like, uh, uh, maybe something that should go into the community scorecard, like, you know, what do the disabled person say? Do they actually need little uh, mock-ups of what the new coinage should be and how, many, how much did that cost to do that? Why did you do something that is actually what blind persons would actually want? Okay, that's all. Thank you.